now I'll be showing you how I made this enormous custom gate. Stay tuned and I'll show you how I did it. As I explained in my last video, my property has two driveways, one that leads to the house and one that leads to my shop. The house gate I made more traditional, but this gate I wanted to design something that is one of a kind and something to do with woodworking. After a little bit of thinking on it, I came up with a metal frame gate with a wooden slab center. The slab will have cracks cut into it and bow ties spanning over them. If you aren't familiar with woodworking, a bow tie is used to span over a crack in a slab of wood to hold the crack together and to stabilize it. It's something functional, but there's also a decorative element to it. The end result might look heavy, but it isn't too bad. To keep the weight down, I went with cedar for the center slab. The gate will be 14 feet across, so I started off with 16 foot boards and I began by laying the boards out on my shop floor to arrange the grain pattern. I wanted the gate to end up around five feet tall, so I bought eight one by sevens and started gluing them together one board at a time. This process took four days total as I could only glue up about two boards a day. I used my Triton biscuit joiner to cut in a slot every foot or so. Then I used Type Bond 3 wood glue as it's waterproof and of course this will be exposed to the elements. Once I got the slab clamped up to start drying, I hopped over to the metal side of my shop and began working on the frame. I started by cutting my square tubing to length at the chop saw, making sure I leveled each joint by shoring it up with some scrap wood before making the cut. After getting the frame pieces cut, I cut a V notch into a scrap piece of wood, then used this to hold the joints up off the ground so that I could bevel each of the ends to ready them to weld. I would get the pieces nice and square, then also make sure that they were flat to one another, then tack them in place to start, double check that things didn't move, and then come back to complete the welds. My frame will eventually look like this, a big rectangle. However, at this point, I only welded together two individual L's, and I kept it separate to make adding in a holding channel easier. A few things about having a giant wooden slab center. The wood will need room to expand and contract, and I consulted with a master craftsman friend of mine, Philip Morley, and he suggested incorporating a U-channel design to hold the wood so that it would hold it at the bottom, but then give me room at the top that could be left empty to allow the, the wood movement. I had trouble finding the size of U-channel that I was needing, so a welder friend of mine, JD, suggested that I just make my own using flat bar. Perfect idea, so that's what I did. I tipped the L-frame up and used magnets to hold the flat bar flush to one side, which will ultimately be the front of the gate. The plan is to make a channel to hold the slab by welding on a piece of flat bar to the front and then also the back of the frame all the way around. After getting the front bar attached, I set a one by piece of wood in place to represent the center slab, then set the back flat bar in. This back bar isn't as easy as the front because it isn't flush to the tubing like the other one. So to make holding this in place easier and consistent all the way down, I used another scrap piece of wood as a spacer in between the magnet and the flat bar. While this held the one by tightly enough, it also left it just a little bit of wiggle room. This process was really slow as this long length flat bar wasn't perfectly flat. So I worked in small sections, moving that scrap board down, then tacking behind it, moving it down, then repeating. After getting the bottom wrapped up, I repeated the process on the upright of the L-frame. Starting with the front since it's the easiest and then moving the wood spacer in place to start on the back. All the while, I would jump back over to the woodworking side of my shop when the previous board on the slab was dry in order to glue up another board to the slab. Of course, I very quickly ran out of long enough clamps, so I resorted to using good old ratchet straps instead. These don't provide the best clamp support, but as the slab is all visual and not structural, I wasn't too concerned about getting a perfect glue joint. Eventually, I outgrew all my clamps and had to rely solely on ratchet straps for clamping. Then, I also eventually outgrew my workbench and had to move the slab down to my shop floor to continue expanding on it. One bad thing about using ratchet straps for clamping is they want to curl up the material when tightening down. To keep the board straight, I would use a scrap piece of wood. There's a lot of scraps being used in this project. <laughs> Running these boards perpendicular to the glue up and making sure that they were under the strap before tightening them down. Finally, the glue up was complete, so it got moved over to the metal side of my shop so I could start cleaning it up just to cut it up. 
I started off using my four inch belt sander and went over the entire thing. And on this, I wasn't going for perfectly flat or smooth. I'm fine with it looking a little rustic, but I did want to remove all of the glue squeeze out and the majority of the fuzz that comes with the cedar right off the shelf. Next, I measured my frame. Actually, I measured it about three times. <laughs> to see exactly how long I needed the slab to be cut to, and then I used my track saw to cut it to length. Of course, with the frame made, I wanted to double check that I wasn't cutting the slab too short. All right, moving on to the cracks. I sketched out the idea for this gate in a modeling software before even getting started. So I already knew what I wanted the cracks and bow tie arrangement to look like. To replicate it as close as I could, I used a tape measure to mark a few key measurements and then connected the marks by freehanding it. Once I finally had all three cracks drawn on that I was happy with, I started cutting. I started off by using my power carver. I was hoping that the cutting tool would be able to cut all the way through the one by, but the diameter is just a tad bit too small. So I used the tool to make the initial cut from the top, then came back with a jigsaw afterwards to complete them. Up next was making the bow ties. I'm making these from some sheet metal and will paint them the same color as the frame. I started off by laying out the pattern. I'll need five total with the biggest coming in at 24 inches and the smallest at 16. Now I freehand a lot of stuff I cut out with the plasma cutter, but since I want these lines to be as spot on as possible, I set up a torch guide using a scrap piece of tubing and two magnets. I positioned this bar half an inch outside of my cut line so that I could rest my cutting torch against it and cut perfect along my line. And man, does that look cool or what? I do love the giant one, but heck, even that small one is so cool in my opinion. When using a plasma cutter, the cutting leaves a buildup on the back called dross. And since I want these to lay flush in my slab, I stuck each bow tie in my super jaws then used a grinder to knock off all of the back dross. And now is a step that I probably spent way too much time on considering there isn't a huge amount that can be changed. But next was to position the bow ties on the slab of cedar across their crack. There's no right or wrong here, but I still took my time and made sure I'd like the placement of all five before tracing them on the slab. I wanted to inset the bow ties so that they would be flush to the slab instead of resting on top. So after tracing them onto the slab, I stuck a straight bit in my router and started carving away the internals of the trace. I would start by going along the perimeter and getting the outline done, then work my way inside. I learned on the very first one to work backwards though, because by starting on the outside and carving towards the middle, I would eventually lose the material to keep my router base flat and the cut consistent. So instead, I would cut the outline, then start on the inside and work towards the perimeter. I hope that makes sense. I bet you can imagine that this was a pretty time consuming process, but I was highly enjoying myself as I was beyond excited to see these bow ties click into place one at a time. After getting all of the bow ties cut, I removed them from the slab and took them outside for a coat of paint. I started with two coats of primer first. While that was drying, I moved inside to give the slab a coat of protection. And I'm going with a semi-transparent stain in the color of cedar. This will keep the slab from graying out over time from the sun. By the time I was done with the slab, which I coated on the front and back, the primer on the bow ties were now dry. So I gave them two coats of paint. While I was in the painting step, I wanted to get the frame outside and also get doused. But first, a few details needed to be sorted. I drilled in some weep holes along what will be the bottom of the frame so that whenever it rains, water will have a route to escape. Then I also cut some flat bar material and welded it to the ends of the open tubing. And now the frame could be moved outside and jiffy rigged to stand up while being painted. You can see that I used a set of super jaws on one end and then a ladder rung for the other. And for this gate, I am going with a hammered textured paint by Rust-Oleum. And while the can says it's a brown, I would almost call it a more pewter color mixed with brown. However, whatever it is, I think it's a lovely color that goes very well with the cedar color. 
Once everything was dry, it was time to set the slab into the bottom frame. And this was a little bit nerve wracking because the slab at this point isn't that secure feeling with those giant cracks cut in. So I first used a scrap board to scab over the largest crack and provide some support. <laughs> Watching this footage, I'm like a person who can't tell a joke because I'm laughing too much to get to the actual punchline. <laughs> That is pretty cool. Okay, I'm setting it in. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> okay. Oh, shit. Oh my goodness. Got it. How's it fit? Oh my goodness, it's perfect. It's like a glove. It's like I measured with the tape and everything. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look how cool that looks. It's easy to not grasp time watching an edited project video, but it took me quite a bit of time to get to this point, so I was just plum tickled that things were moving so smoothly and my vision for this gate was actually coming together. After that, next was to lift the top half of the frame into place. But before that, while I still had access, I placed some nuts on the bottom channel underneath that center slab so that whenever it does rain, the slab won't just be sitting in a pool of water. All right, next I grabbed Cody's help again to set the top frame into place. Okay. Now I could weld the frame closed. Since I repainted the frame, I used a grinder to grind off any paint that was in the way of where I needed to weld. Then after laying down a bead, I used a grinder to knock it down smooth so that it would look seamless. To do any touch up paint, I ripped off some cardboard thin enough to fit between the slab and the frame. Let's move to adding in those cool bow ties, shall we? I thought about gluing them in, but instead decided to anchor them in from the back. I cut some three quarter inch square tubing and first welded them to the frame where they would be covered up by the bow tie and not able to be seen from the front. Going to the back, I drilled a hole through this back tubing. Set the bow tie in place, then marked where the bow tie lined up to this hole. This is so I could grind off the paint on the back and we'll have a clean work surface to weld the head of a carriage bolt to. Now before setting it back into place, I slipped the carriage bolt in again, but this time with the head facing the bow tie. Then place the bow tie in its spot. Now I could just make sure that the bolt head was shoved up against the bow tie, then give it a few good tack welds to hold it in place. And I like this method over gluing them in because I don't know how the wood will react over time to these. I'm curious to see if the wood movement will pop them out or maybe deform slightly around them. Or maybe it'll all work out great and nothing will ever need to be adjusted. Either way, I'm wanting to leave myself a way to take them off and do some work if the need arises. Man alive, it took so much work to get to this point, but I can't tell you how pleased I am with it. I love having something so unique and representative of something that I love. It also kind of pleases me that only a small population of people will be able to see the gate and understand what it represents. It's like we're part of a, of a secret club. Stay tuned for the next video where I go into the details on how uh, I installed this one as well as the other gate. Hope that you're enjoying the series so far and I'll see you then. Actually, before I let you go, this project inspired a fun t-shirt idea that says stop cracks in their tracks. Of course, with a slab of wood and a few bow ties. I have these shirts for sale for a limited time, so if you're interested in picking one up and supporting what I do, then please see the link in the description down below. I have them in either male or female cut, plus a variety of colors. Okay, that's really it for this one. <laughs> I'll see you next time.